Good morning, everybody. Um, the reading today is Psalm 52, and that can be found on page 574. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? Why do you boast all day long? You who are a disgrace in the eyes of God, you who practice deceit, your tongue plots destruction. It is like a sharpened razor. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word, you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He will snatch you up and pluck you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear. They will laugh at you, saying, Here now is the man who did not make God his stronghold, but be trusted in his but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. But I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. And I will hope in your name, for your name is good. Uh, thanks, Lex. Uh, do keep that passage open. Uh, we're also going to need uh, 1 Samuel 21. So uh, you might want to keep a finger in Psalm 52 and also look up uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. If someone's got a page number, you could shout it out for, for others. 1 Samuel 21. 293. 293. It's five points for Martin. It sounded like Martin. I can't see him. Aaron. Oh, it's Aaron. Martin Foley and Aaron, same voice, who knew? Uh, <laughs> Martin's over there shaking his head with despair. <laughs> uh, did everyone get that? What was the number? 293, brilliant. Uh, let me pray as we begin to look through this psalm together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And we thank you for the psalms, which we're uh, enjoying looking through this summer. We pray that they would challenge us, pray that they'd encourage us. We pray that they'd speak to our hearts because we know it is your word speaking to us by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, Psalm 51 to 72 um, all have headings, if you were to have a flick through, uh, relating to events in the real life of King David. Uh, so uh, Dave... Uh, referred to Psalm 51 and David's uh, adultery with Bathsheba uh, during our confession. We're looking at 52 today. Uh, but you could read any of these Psalms uh, and just from the face value of them, benefit a little. But journey into the life and the experience of David the Psalmist uh, around the time and for the reason of which he wrote the Psalm. And we see that these Psalms are even more powerful for us today. Uh, so Psalm 52, the introduction tells us this. Uh, a maskil of David, no one's quite sure what maskil means, uh, probably just a, a musical term. When Daeg the Edomite had gone to Saul and told him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Uh, so at this point in David's life, when he writes this psalm, uh, before even the event of uh, going to Ahimelech, he's told by the prophet Samuel that he is going to be the next king of Israel. Uh, the problem is, if you know uh, the story at all, there's already a king, King Saul. Uh, who the people have chosen. And King Saul likes David. He's let him marry his daughter. I mean, you've got to kind of like someone to allow that to happen. Uh, he's appointed him head of his bodyguard military unit, uh, but he really doesn't want David to be the next king. Uh, he wants his own name, his own heritage to continue. Uh, and as uh, the story progresses, uh, King Saul's mood and envy kind of worsens over time. Uh, and uh, eventually he tries to kill David, and David flees. Uh, it's a huge betrayal uh, of, by King Saul. After, after all, David is very careful to honour King Saul and to make effort, every effort to serve him well. Uh, David's got no intentions, it seems, to take the throne by force, uh, although Saul presumably thinks he's going to. David shows trust in God's promises and God's good timings. 
And so he waits patiently. But Saul, he's out for blood uh, and literally out for blood, as we'll begin to see. And then this psalm is written in response to the, uh, to the events that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 21. So uh, if you've got that in front of you, they are on the screen as well. Uh, but uh, you might prefer to follow it in your Bible. So this is uh, the beginning of the event around which this psalm was written. Uh, David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? Uh, it's an odd thing. David turns up like this on his own. Uh, why is this great man traveling alone? Ahimelech knows who David is. Uh, later on, uh, Ahimelech is going to be called to King Saul and ask what's about this event. And this is how Ahimelech is going to describe David to King Saul. Uh, it's on the screen. This is from chapter 22 of 1 Samuel. Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? So Ahimelech knows something's up. David turns up out of the blue on his own, but he decides to help him anyway. Uh, so he provides food for David. Uh, he, uh, David takes that food to a rendezvous, rendezvous point where he's going to meet some of his uh, faithful followers that he's prearranged to meet. Ahimelech even gives him a sword. He arms him. Uh, ironically, it's the very sword of Goliath, that giant of a man who David had formerly previously killed with just his uh, shepherd's sling and a stone. Uh, so the hero, David, hero of Israel, now unfairly the enemy, and now carrying the enemy's sword, and he's armed by Ahimelech. Uh, but Psalm 52 is not about this kind of general betrayal of King Saul or David's fleeing. It's something far darker, far more personal than all of that. It's actually a psalm that is seeking justice for a guilt that David feels he'll always have to carry from that day when he went to meet Ahimelech. You see, while David was there, uh, persuading Ahimelech the priest to help him, trying to conceal from Ahimelech what was really going on, there was a traitor in their midst. Have a look at verse 7 of chapter 1, still in 1 Samuel. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. Uh, David, now armed and fled, leaves Ahimelech, but the dominoes of evil are already falling. A tragedy is on the way. We pick up the story a much later, flick forward to chapter 22, verse 6. Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered, and Saul was seated, spear in hand, under the tamarisk tree on the hill of Gibeah, with all his officials standing at his side. Uh, so Saul is demanding information. He's heard that uh, David's been seen somewhere and he wants his officials to tell him, but his officials stay quiet, which is interesting, isn't it? He wants to know their thoughts, but they're brave men to stand up and be quiet before this slightly unhinged king with spear in hand. Their choice is clear. Do they trust the earthly self-elevating King Saul? they trust God's word and the promised king who is to come through the words of the prophet Samuel. And they seem to be standing by God's chosen king, David. But, verse 9 of chapter 22, but Deog, the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, he's there, said, oh, I saw the son of Jesse a little while ago, come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitab, at Nob. Uh, he's like the classic snitch, isn't he? Where you, from all these stories we read, that he's sniveling up to the king. And he goes on, verse 10 of chapter 22. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath that the Philistine How could he. We know something terrible is brewing. And verse 11. So then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitab. And all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Uh, so Ahimelech uh, now is summoned to the king. He brings his whole family, all the other priests of Nob. Uh, and uh, Ahimelech pleads, but why wouldn't we look after David? He, he was a great man. You, you, why would we? You didn't know anything. Verse 15. 
Oh, was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Why, why wouldn't I? Of course not. Let the king not accuse your servant of any of his father or any of his father's family. For your servant knows nothing about this whole affair. Uh, he's really between a rock and a hard place, isn't he, Ahimelech? Uh, he's helped David, even though he knew something was up. He, he truthfully can say, I didn't know anything of the actual dispute. Uh, but he knew something was going on. And King Saul's response is utterly brutal. Verse 16, but the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. But it's not just the officials who can't bring themselves to side with King Saul and against God at this point. Even Saul's guards are not prepared to follow his orders. So verse 17, so the king's given the order. The king ordered the guards to decide, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, and yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were unwilling to raise their hand to strike the priest of the Lord. Nobody is acting for King Saul. Ahimelech and his family, well, and the priests, perhaps they're safe. David's actions haven't brought disaster on them. Or has it? Deogar Snitch raises his head again, perhaps his hand. He wanted to be seen. Verse 18 of chapter 22, the king then ordered Deog, you turn and strike down the priests. So Deog, the Edomite, turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod, so the priests. He also put the sword, sorry, put to the sword knob the town of the priests with, all, with its men and women, its children and infants and its cattle, donkeys and sheep. Well, he's really gone above and beyond for his king, hasn't he? This guy really wanted a name for himself, didn't he? Uh, he was a shepherd and perhaps he wanted to be aspiring to be as famous, if not more famous than the shepherd David. But he was going to do it his way. He was going to bring fame to himself, happy to murder hundreds of people, a whole town, even the women and children and the infants and the cattle and the animals. Uh, it is horrific. And you can only imagine how David feels when he hears news of this report. And he hears about it pretty quickly. Uh, verse 20 of chapter 22, Solomon 1 Samuel. But one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitab, named Abathar, escaped. So one escapes, and he fled to join David. He told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abathar, that day, when Deog the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. Well, we know how David feels, don't we? He feels responsible for the death of an entire town, the whole family of this one son who has escaped. If only I'd not gone there, he's thinking. If only I hadn't asked for help that day. If only I'd taken out Deo with Goliath's sword at that point. If only. And now I feel the guilt of an entire town and family. I wonder what sort of psalm, what sort of prayer would we be saying to God in response to all of that? I doubt we'll find many direct parallels of that event in our own lives. But that feeling of trying to do the right thing by God, but feeling he's perhaps let you down. Why, why God? Why has this happened? Or when you strive to serve God, but your life is seemingly sort of falling apart. When you've made great sacrifices for Jesus, but paid the price in one way or another, or worse, those who you love have paid the price. Maybe for someone listening or sitting here, we're simply trying to stay alive as David was, and it's not going well. Did I make the wrong decision? Was it my fault? Why didn't God help me? I've honoured him the best I can. Why would he do this to me? Perhaps we're expecting a psalm in response to this 
episode similar to the one we listened to last week, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? But we get something very different, something that might be far more freeing than a blame game. We get a psalm of confidence in God Almighty, even when the world around us is falling apart. So Psalm 52, verse 1. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? It's the biting irony, calling Deog a hero. Why do you boast all day long, you who are a disgrace in the eyes of of God. It is clear who David still has his confidence in. Despite the evidence of David's victory, in a sense, David is very confident that he has picked a fight with the wrong person, with the wrong God. Verse 3 in Psalm 52, you love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word, you deceitful tongue. It's the world's words that bring about the persecution, the suffering, the boasting, the self-elevation that we see around us. And it's often apparently very successful. Deod's doing well. And while we keep our confidence in the Lord, our boasting in him, we apparently lose some battles. As the saying goes, they may have won the battle, but they have not won the war. Speaking of Dag and his temporary victory, verse 5 of Psalm 52. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He will snatch you up and pluck you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. It's incredible faith, isn't it, of David? Following all of that, he has confidence in the Lord and his justice. David feels responsible for the death of an entire town. And yet in the face of such reality, he keeps his eyes fixed on an eternal reality and says the ungodly will face the justice of God. The evil will face an eternal ruin. Justice will be restored. The war will be won. The tents that they think they're safe in will be ripped from them. The roots, however deep they think they are, will not hold them secure. Verse 6, the righteous will see and fear. They will laugh at you, saying, here now is a man who did not take God, make God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew stronger by destroying others. I don't think we'll laugh at judgment. Well, that will be a terrible thing. But we will laugh, says David, if we stand strong in the Lord, at the folly of those who are so evil that they put their own fate in their own wealth and success. Just like most of us did before we decided to follow Jesus instead. Presumably, Deog became rich and famous for his actions. But he stood firm in the wrong thing. All your confidence, bravado, showing off, big words, fighting talk, evil against others, power, status, all those things that the world so often clings for. You stood firm in the wrong thing, says David in response to this. And the righteous, those who fear God, will laugh at that kind of foolishness. Because that is what it is. Just as God laughs at the evil of all mankind. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 5. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. Psalm 52 really reminds us that the, the trials we face, the persecution seen against Christians in other countries across our world, the apparent success of the world around us, even the backfiring attempts of our own attempts to serve God that lead to pain for us and for others, well, it's not misplaced. Keep on going. Stand firm in the Lord. It's not going to go on like this forever. Our confidence 
is to remain steadfast in the Lord God and what is to come. All the injustices, as we've seen and experienced in our lives, perhaps even the ones we feel responsible for, will be righted one day. If your confidence is in yourself today, perhaps this shows us we should think again. For those of us who do have our confidence in God, well, in the face of this evil world and the trials we face, even as David is on the run without a home, without regular food, in fear of asking for help in case he brings more disaster upon those who serve him, how does he respond? How should we respond? Not in despair, not in fear, not in a sense of doom. Verse 8, but I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Unlike the roots of the wicked that will just be ripped up as easily as that, this huge olive tree with its enormous root system is secure. In fact, it's so secure, it's in the house of God, under his love, his care and protection, not just for the trials we face now, but forever and ever. Our destiny, our eternal security with God the Father, gives us a perspective towards the evil we see in this world around us. We need not blame God for letting these things happen. God has promised that he will right all wrongs. So verse 9, for what you have done, speaking to God now, for what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people, and I will hope in your name, for your name is good. So certainly this psalm helps us by reminding us that our destiny is not in our hands, but is in the hands of our maker. Whatever it looks like around us, whatever you're going through at the moment, whatever your life experiences are, we simply submit ourselves to the eternal promises of God, submit to his rule and not our own. But this psalm is not just about getting our thinking right, as we've been thinking about as helpful as that is and right as that is. Uh, imagine for a minute you are the one son of Ahimelech who has escaped and found David to report that news. You're, you're that guy. Uh, what sort of response do you want? What, what sort of psalm do you want from your future king? What do you want him to say or to do? Having just seen your whole world just be destroyed, by the evil of others. It's an almighty blow to your entire life and family and everything you know. What kind of psalm do you want? What do you want your coming king to say? Well, you want a psalm that reminds you how confident you can be in your king. But you haven't just come to a king who reminds you to stand strong in the promises. You come to a king who is the fulfillment of your promises. So as Ahimelech's son listens, listens to the psalm, what does he hear? Not that he must be a strong olive tree and must trust in the promises of God, as right and good as that is, but that his king, David, is a strong olive tree who does trust in God's promises. And so David does for Ahimelech's son what Jesus does for us. He doesn't just say, well, chin up. It'll be all right. Just keep on plodding away. He says, you'll be all right because I am the olive tree. David, Jesus, is the one, verse 9, who will praise God, the Father, in the presence of the faithful people. It is the king who does it and proclaims the truth to us. So as we come to Jesus, we aren't just reminded to trust God's promises. We actually come to God's promises. Jesus himself. He has defeated all evil and worldly boasting when he gave his life as a ransom for those who will repent before him and believe. He will come again to end all injustice, to put all things right to give eternal life to those who look to Jesus for salvation, who look to him for justice. Jesus does not do this and that, doesn't say do this and do that, 
and, and then think about it and all be okay. He, he does it for us. He says, trust in me. He says, you have chosen right by coming to me. I will protect you eternally. Whatever happens in this world around you, however terrible your past is, you've come to the right place. And so we come to him again today, maybe for the first time, if we don't trust and believe in him already and repentance and belief. So that whatever our life looks like, however much you have sacrificed for Jesus, however much, uh, however little earthly reward you have received, however painful or joyful your summer will be or is going already, do not forget to turn to your everlasting king, to your olive tree in the house of God, your king who will always trust and always obey and always fulfill the promises of God on your behalf. The king, Jesus, who says exactly what David said to Ahimelech's son when he first arrived and told him of this tragedy and the evil that he was running from. <laughs> Samuel 22, verse 23, this is the last words he says to Ahimelech's son. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. Did it on a cross. But you will be safe <coughs> with me. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. But you will be safe with me. Let me pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we reflect on life and see that uh, much of it is painful, that often the world seems to win the battles, that often our life is not easy or comfortable or straightforward, that in striving to serve you, things don't always work out brilliantly in our own lives. We thank you that we come to a king who is confident, who knows the victory is secure, who says to us, stay with me, don't be afraid, you will be safe with me. Turn our hearts towards the Lord Jesus today, we pray. Amen. Amen.